Welcome to Bite at a Time Books, where we read you your favorite classics one bite at a time. My name is Bree Carlisle, and I love to read and wanted to share my passion with listeners like you. If you want to know what's coming next and vote on upcoming books, sign up for our newsletter at biteatatimebooks.com. Be sure to follow my show on your favorite podcast platform so you get all the new episodes. You can find most of our links in the show notes. But also, our website, biteatatimebooks.com, includes all of the links for our show, including to our Patreon to support the show and YouTube, where we have special behind the narration of the episodes. We're part of the Bite at a Time Books Productions Network. If you'd also like to hear what inspired your favorite classic author to write their novels and what was going on in the world at the time, check out the Bite at a Time Books Behind the Story podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. Today we'll be continuing The Life and Adventures of Santa Claus by L. Frank Baum. 3. How the Reels Colored the Toys A hush lay on the Laughing Valley now. Snow covered it like a white spread, and pillows of downy flakes drifted before the dwelling, where Claus sat feeding the blaze of the fire. The brook gurgled on beneath a heavy sheet of ice, and all living plants and insects nestled close to Mother Earth to keep warm. The face of the moon was hid by dark clouds, and the wind, delighting in the wintry sport, pushed and whirled the snowflakes in so many directions that they could get no chance to fall to the ground. Claus heard the wind whistling and shrieking in its play, and thanked the good Nooks again for his comfortable shelter. Blinky washed her face lazily and stared at the coals with a look of perfect content. The toy cat sat opposite the real one and gazed straight ahead as toy cats should. Suddenly, Claus heard a noise that sounded different from the noise of the wind. It was more like a wail of suffering and despair. He stood up and listened, but the wind, growing boisterous, shook the door and rattled the windows to distract his attention. He waited until the wind was tired, and then still listening, he heard once more the shrill cry of distress. Quickly, he drew on his coat, pulled his cap over his eyes, and opened the door. The wind dashed in and scattered the embers over the hearth, at the same time blowing Blinky's fur so furiously that she crept under the table to escape. Then the door was closed and Claus was outside, peering anxiously into the darkness. The wind laughed and scolded and tried to push him over, but he stood firm. The helpless flakes stumbled against his eyes and dimmed his sight, but he rubbed them away and looked again. Snow was everywhere, white and glittering. It covered the earth and filled the air. The cry was not repeated. Claus turned to go back into the house, but the wind caught him unawares, and he stumbled and fell across a snowdrift. His hand plunged into the drift and touched something that was not snow. This he seized, and pulling it gently toward him, found it to be a child. The next moment, he had lifted it in his arms and carried it into the house. The wind followed him through the door, but Claus shut it out quickly. He laid the rescued child on the hearth, and brushing away the snow, he discovered it to be Weakum, a little boy who lived in a house beyond the valley. Claus wrapped a warm blanket around the little one and rubbed the frost from its limbs. Before long, the child opened his eyes and, seeing where he was, smiled happily. Then Claus warmed milk and fed it to the boy slowly, while the cat looked on with sober curiosity. Finally, the little one curled up in his friend's arms and sighed and fell asleep. And Claus, filled with gladness that he had found the wanderer, held him closely while he slumbered. The wind, finding no more mischief to do, climbed the hill and swept on toward the north. This gave the weary snowflakes time to settle down to earth, and the valley became still again. The boy, having slept well in the arms of his friend, opened his eyes and sat up. Then, as a child will, he looked around the room and saw all that it contained. "'Your cat is a nice cat, Claus,' he said at last. "'Let me hold it.' But Puss objected and ran away. "'The other cat won't run, Claus,' continued the boy. "'Let me hold that one.' Claus placed the toy in his arms, and the boy held it lovingly and kissed the tip of its wooden ear. "'How did you get lost in the storm, Weakum?' asked Claus." 
I started to walk to my auntie's house and lost my way, answered Weakum. Were you frightened? It was cold, said Weakum, and the snow got in my eyes so I could not see. Then I kept on till I fell in the snow without knowing where I was, and the wind blew the flakes over me and covered me up. Claus gently stroked his head, and the boy looked up at him and smiled. I'm all right now, said Weakum. Yes, replied Claus happily. Now I will put you in my warm bed, and you must sleep until morning, when I will carry you back to your mother. May the cat sleep with me? asked the boy. Yes, if you wish it to, answered Claus. It's a nice cat, Weakum said, smiling, as Claus tucked the blankets around him. And presently the little one fell asleep with the wooden toy in his arms. When morning came, the sun claimed the Laughing Valley and flooded it with his rays. So Claus prepared to take the lost child back to its mother. May I keep the cat, Claus? asked Weakum. It's nicer than real cats. It don't run away or scratch or bite. May I keep it? Yes, indeed, answered Claus, pleased that the toy he had made could give pleasure to the child. So he wrapped the boy and the wooden cat in a warm cloak perching the bundle upon his own broad shoulders, and then he tramped through the snow and the drifts of the valley and across the plain beyond to the poor cottage where Weakum's mother lived. See, Mama? cried the boy as soon as they entered. I've got a cat! The good woman wept tears of joy over the rescue of her darling and thanked Claus many times for his kind act. So he carried a warm and happy heart back to his home in the valley. That night he said to Puss, I believe the children who love the wooden cats almost as well as the real ones, and they can't hurt them by pulling their tails and ears. I'll make another. So this was the beginning of his great work. The next cat was better made than the first. While Claus sat whittling it out in the yellow reel came in to make him a visit, and so pleased was he with the man's skill that he ran away and brought several of his fellows. There sat the red reel, the black reel, the green reel, the blue reel, and the yellow reel in a circle on the floor, while Claus whittled and whistled and the wooden cat grew into shape. If it could be made the same color as the real cat, no one would know the difference, said the yellow reel thoughtfully. The little ones maybe would not know the difference, replied Claus, pleased with the idea. I'll bring you some of the red that I color my roses and tulips with cried the red wheel, and then you can make the cat's lips and tongue red. I will bring some of the green that I color my grasses and leaves with, said the green wheel, and then you can color the cat's eyes green. They will need a bit of yellow also, remarked the yellow wheel. I must fetch some of the yellow that I used to color my buttercups and goldenrods with. The real cat is black, said the black reel. I will bring some of the black that I used to color the eyes of my pansies with, and then you can paint your wooden cat black. I see you have a blue ribbon around Blinky's neck, added the blue reel. I will get some of the color that I used to paint the bluebells and forget-me-nots with, and then you can carve a wooden ribbon on the toy cat's neck and paint it blue. So the reels disappeared. And by the time Claus had finished carving out the form of the cat, they were all back with the paints and brushes. They made Blinky sit upon the table, that Claus might paint the toy cat just the right color. And when the work was done, the reels declared it was exactly as good as a live cat. That is to all appearances, added the red reel. Blinky seemed a little offended by the attention bestowed upon the toy, and that she might not seem to approve the imitation cat. She walked to the corner of the hearth and sat down with a dignified air. But Claus was delighted. And as soon as morning came, he started out and tramped through the snow across the valley and the plain, until he came to a village. There, in a poor hut near the walls of the beautiful palace of the Lord of Lurd, a little girl lay upon a wretched cot, moaning with pain. Claus approached the child and kissed her and comforted her, and then he drew the toy cat from beneath his coat where he had hidden it and placed it in her arms. Ah, how well he felt himself repaid for his labor and his long walk when he saw the little one's eyes grow bright with pleasure. She hugged the kitty tight to her breast, as if it had been a precious gem and would not let it go for a single moment. The fever was quieted, 
The pain grew less, and she fell into a sweet and refreshing sleep. Claus laughed and whistled and sang all the way home. Never had he been so happy as on that day. When he entered his house, he found Shigra, the lioness, awaiting him. Since his babyhood, Shigra had loved Claus, and while he dwelt in the forest, she had often come to visit him at Nasil's bower. After Claus had gone to live in the Laughing Valley, Shigra became lonely and ill at ease, and now she had braved the snowdrifts, which all lions abhor to see him once more. Shigra was getting old, and her teeth were beginning to fall out, while the hairs that tipped her ears and tail had changed from tawny yellow to white. Claus found her lying on his hearth, and he put his arms around the neck of the lioness and hugged her lovingly. The cat had retired into a far corner. She did not care to associate with Shigra. Claus told his old friend about the cats he had made, and how much pleasure they had given Weakum and the sick girl. Shigra did not know much about children. Indeed, if she met a child, she could scarcely be trusted not to devour it. But she was interested in Claus's new labors and said, "'These images seem to me very attractive, yet I cannot see why you should make cats which are very unimportant animals. Suppose now that I am here, you make the image of a lioness, the queen of all beasts. Then indeed your children will be happy and safe at the same time.' Claus thought this was a good suggestion, so he got a piece of wood and sharpened his knife, while Shigor crouched upon the hearth at his feet. With much care, he carved the head in the likeness of the lioness, even to the two fierce teeth that curved over her lower lip and the deep frowning lines above her wide-open eyes. When it was finished, he said, "'You have a terrible look, Shigra. "'Then the image is like me,' she answered." for I am indeed terrible to all who are not my friends. Claus now carved out the body, with Shigra's long tail trailing behind it. The image of the crouching lioness was very lifelike. It pleases me, said Shigra, yawning and stretching her body gracefully. Now I will watch while you paint. He brought the paints the reels had given him from the cupboard and colored the image to resemble the real Shigra. The lioness placed her big padded paws upon the edge of the table and raised herself while she carefully examined the toy that was her likeness. "'You are indeed skillful,' she said proudly. "'The children will like that better than cats, I'm sure.' Then snarling at Blinky, who arched her back in terror and whined fearfully, she walked away toward her forest home with stately strides. "'Thank you for joining Bite at a Time Books today.' while we read a bite of one of your favorite classics. Again, my name is Brie Carlisle, and I hope you come back tomorrow for the next bite of The Life and Adventures of Santa Claus. Don't forget to sign up for our newsletter at biteatatimebooks.com. You can check out the show notes or our website biteatatimebooks.com for the rest of the links for our show.